it's my friend. I've known Joel now, man, a number of years. It's been, I feel like it's been like 10, 15 years now, somewhere in that range. And uh, it's so good to have my friend Joel Chop on the podcast today. So, Joel, welcome to the Monday Christian Podcast. I think this is your first time. Yeah, I think so. Thanks so much for uh, having me, Ezra and, and David. It's great to yeah. see both of you. Well, absolutely. And we go back a number of years and we spent some time in Toronto together and all that. So you're one of the few friends that I feel like knows me from that time in my life. So it's it's cool yeah. to kind of reconnect with you and, and all that. So yeah, yeah thanks. thanks absolutely. Um, and then further even back at, at college too. So I know, yeah. I know. It's, it's it's pretty cool. So one of the things I've always, yeah, I've appreciated your work from afar and then getting to know you more and things like that. And you've worked on a book called uh, Science and the Doctrine of Creation. And before we get into all that, you know, our, we're going to talk about the relationship between faith and um, and science and how they, how they relate to each other. But going back in time, how did you first come to faith in Christ? Because I don't, I don't recall ever really having this discussion. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of curious to see how far back this went with you. Yeah. Well, so uh, I was raised in a Christian household. My dad uh, is a pastor. Uh, so I was um, going to church from uh, infancy uh, regularly. Um, and uh, so I I have that uh, rich heritage to draw from. Um, but then also I didn't really... Um, Faith became my own. I started, uh, I, I like to use the language, I started walking with the Lord when I was um, right around 13. Uh, and that's um, that's when I started to grasp for myself uh, the truths of the Christian faith and uh, started to recognize the ways uh, in which the gospel um, is not just uh, true things that we believe, but that uh, transform our lives. Um was there kind of an aha moment for you or yeah what that uh, it was it was a series of aha moments that resulted in a definite change in perspective uh it was through conversations uh late night conversations with uh a couple friends um who were who were believers as well um actually you know one of them pete pete highly yeah. Um, and so it was through conversations with him and his family. Um, so yeah, it was, it was around that time period. And then, uh, a couple years later, um, at a church camp, in fact, uh, I discerned a call to ministry. Um, hmm. and so, uh, right around then when I was 16 ish, uh, bordering on 17 is when I realized that I, I wanted to go and pursue theological education. Um, so it's, it's funny, Dave and I were just talking about this offline that, you know, we're kind of, it's kind of frustrating sometimes where there sometimes there's such a push to let's get people saved. Right. And without realizing that a lot of times it's a slow progression and that there's many things that happen in a person's life. So Dave, that's one of the things I'm thinking about as I hear this. I don't know. I'm curious to get your perspective. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Joel, what's up, man? I don't know if you remember this, but I think you're the one that introduced me in college to I'm for sure. I think Chesterton, you handed me a book oh, yeah. at some point. Yeah. And also I think, I think you were the guy that hooked me up with some Malcolm Muggeridge. Does that sound uh, about right? That, that uh, sounds right. Yeah. yeah. So you, you <laughs> that gave sounds me very right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, uh, sort of this music guy and he was like this theology guy and, uh, hook, he hooked me up with some books. So I just remember that, but, um, I was just curious as you've sort of pursued more education. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. I was talking with us beforehand, like, you're writing with some really great people who I would consider like heavyweights a little bit. You know what I mean? This, this book, you ha have this great privilege. Um, how do you, as you learn more and spend more time in these circles with people that have these hugely deep conversations, how does that, how does that help you mm -hmm. doing local church ministry slash just like, being around, how, how does that impact your love or how you interact or interface with the local church? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and in fact, so the, um, the position that I was, I was in uh, with the Henry Center, uh, which is what the book came out of, uh, was a Templeton-funded project on science and doctrine of creation. Uh, the purpose of the Henry Center 
was to bridge the gap uh, between the academy and the church. Um, because there is, there can be um, a disconnect. And I think that's, that's what you're driving at, uh, Dave, is um, between kind of heady academic theology and then um, the life of the local church and, and what that looks like in ministry. Um, so I, I, I tend to think about it uh, in two ways. So first, um, you know, there at, at GBS, um, the, the emphasis that just got pounded over and over and over and over again were the two great commandments. Love God. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Love your neighbor. And um, I see academic theology as an exercise in loving the Lord with your mind. Um, wow, thinking great. carefully and critically and deeply about the deep things of God um, and loving him that way. And then that needs to translate over into love of neighbor. Um, how can I use this this reflection that I've been able to undertake uh, about God uh, in my service to the local church. Um, there are ways that that is done well. Um, there are ways that that is done poorly. I've engaged in both. Um, <laughs> Same. <laughs> the, the latter, not on purpose, obviously. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I think um, it's... It's actually, it's really, really hard work figuring out, okay, um, if this is what we believe about God, um, what does that look like? How should that transform believers? Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I see some of the work that I've done as attempting to uh, minister to different segments of Christ's church. So, like, for example, the book... Um, you know, the fact is, uh, scientists go to church too. Um, in, in any given local congregation, odds are, if it's average size, there's probably someone in the pew that has some sort of broadly scientific vocation, whether that's a high school bi biology teacher, whether that's a registered nurse, um, whether that is, you know, a rocket scientist that works for the Jet Propulsion Laboratories. Those are rarer, obviously, but um, there are quite a few folks who are faithful, God-fearing Christians in the pews uh, who, who work in the sciences um, who can encounter what they perceive to be as tensions between um, what they believe about the world when they put on their scientific glasses and what they believe about the world when they put on their theological glasses. Mm. And that can create a tension. Um, and so one of the ways I see um, the value of doing um, more academic theology is thinking through carefully and rigorously, okay, what are Christians committed to? Um, what are their foundational theological beliefs and how does that map onto um, things that we genuinely know about the world from other ways, such as the natural sciences? And so that's, yeah, that's one way that I think that um, academic theology can, if done well and carefully, be a service to the church is helping Christians navigate those issues. I, I'm curious when you talk to people mm -hmm. that are scientists in the local church and they interact with you, what do they do when they go to a church where the teaching and preaching on Sunday morning feels very inadequate or, or very, um, very different from the world that they're in all the time. And they feel it's, it's almost incompatible as though they're speaking two different languages. Yeah. You know, I've got ideas about what they do about how they reconcile that in, the, in their mind, but what's been your experience? Yeah, no, no, that's a great question, Ezra. Um, so lots of different ways that they, they react, they respond. Um, I would say that among, among our churches, um, so kind of broadly conservative evangelical, um, the majority response is to, if, 
if this is at a church that they love and they're committed to is to keep their head down. Um, yeah. is right. they, they tend to, um, when the controversial issues get raised, they know that they're controversial. They don't want to cause a big ruckus. And so they, they'll kind of hunker down and, um, and perhaps they themselves have uh, worked through themselves uh, what they believe about the issues, um, their own understanding of how to reconcile the apparent tensions, the apparent conflicts. Um, so maybe not. Maybe maybe they haven't actually figured it out. That's common too. Is you know they'll. It's not that they're doubting right. their faith, right. but. When you ask them, well, how do you square what you believe over here in the lab on Monday morning with what you say exactly you on Sunday? And sometimes, they're, well, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's almost like if they speak up then, too, I think they feel, man, I don't have the, I'm just assuming here, but it seems like from what I've heard it seems like they can think, well, I'm not a theologian, right? So who am I to really speak up here? And so they can we kind of lose that voice and oftentimes, and this can happen in so many different realms, right? In the church, people that have all different skills and gift sets that they they have on Monday that they bring to church and feel like what's being communicated is so far removed from their everyday lives. And, And so for the person that's watching and listening and they're, you know, scientifically inclined and they love this kind of thing, and that's, that's where their life's passion is. What do you say to a person like that who's watching and listening and feels that tension and feels and maybe attends a church where they feel like that that there's a divorce between science and faith? Yeah, yeah. Now that that's a great question. Um, so I think, um, and, and this, I think first, uh, let me say, I think you're completely right. That happens often. Is the scientists. Uh, or, and I'm using that term broadly to mean the sort of right. folks that I mentioned earlier. So an right. RN counts as a scientist, a, yep. you know, um, but the scientifically inclined folks in the congregation, most often they recognize, well, you know, the pastor, you know, this is his job. He knows theology. He, I don't. So, um, but, uh, tacking onto that, um, it actually, I've often, I've, found in, in t- working with congregations on these issues, um, the, the worries actually go the other way too, is if the pastor is, is, is conscientious, if he's humble, if, if he knows um, what he's talking about, he'll recognize they know a lot more about the science than I do. You know, like they, it's been, you know, what, 25 years since I took biology in high school. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember the mitochondria and that's it. <laughs> like powerhouse of the cell and, and yeah. nothing else. Um, yeah. and so they recognize that like, you know, they, they're firm in their theological beliefs, but they, they might not have the scientific training really to even understand the questions. Um, so, uh, what, what we do to encourage uh, and, and by me, we, I'm referring to uh, the project that I've been involved in. Uh, what we've done to encourage pastors and congregations is to get together with small groups and read books together. Um, books that are that are bridging the scientific, uh, the science theology divide together. Throw, throw out some names. What were some good books? Oh, man. Uh, so... Uh, uh, uh. Here we go. Uh oh. For those of you listening, Jewel has, he's always had a massive bookshelf. And so he has to go back and get, yep. dig into his treasure trove here. All right. So, uh, where's the camera? This ah, book. There we go. Yep. Fantastic. This is hmm. Reading Genesis Well by C. John Collins, uh, Jack Collins. Um, and uh, he teaches at Covenant Seminary. Um, and it is an in-depth examination of Genesis 1 through 11, where he he actually relies on C.S. Lewis as um, a reader of texts to show us how to read texts well. And he does so with an eye towards kind of the scientific implications of the text. That's an excellent book. 
Um, another excellent book, Gavin Ortland's Retrieving Augustine's Doctrine of Creation. Um, so this looks at, because um, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, one of the, the giants in church history, um, how he interpreted the opening passages of Genesis, and this with a particular eye towards some of the more controversial issues in the science and theology discussions today within conservative evangelicalism. Um, and what this book does beautifully is it, um, it messes with our categories because um, there's a common narrative that um, goes something like, well, um, all Christians believed exactly the same things about how to interpret Genesis 1 and 2 until this guy named Darwin came along and he messed everything up for the church. And then all of a sudden, everybody changed all their views uh, mm. and started Being interpreting liberal. the text radically differently. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, and what Gavin's book does very nicely is show, well, no, actually, that's, uh, that's an overly simplistic narrative. Uh, there's always been debates about how we should read these opening passages of Genesis and, and also what it means to read literally. Um, most of us work with some pretty hard and fast assumptions about what a literal reading of the text means. Yeah, right. Um, that doesn't map onto not just patristic, but uh, medieval and Reformation accounts of what literal reading actually means. Um, Dave, Dave, I want to pull you back into this here, but Joel, just one quick question on this. I mean, mm -hmm. for you personally, I mean, I'm you're very, obviously very well read, and this is in your sweet spot in a way. Um, but as you've, you know, you went from a young kid becoming a Christian, and then I'm sure you've gone through numerous evolutions of your faith where it's deepened and grown. I mean, how have you approached that? Because I, I think this is my, my personal view. I think some Christians, it's kind of a terrifying feeling because you adapt a view of God that you think is pretty firm. And then you have challenges where people think, oh, well, the way you interpret Genesis 1, for example, Genesis 2, is a little bit different than the way I would interpret it. Interpret it. And then you think, oh, man, yeah, and this strong Christian here holds this view. And then this strong Christian that I thought was really great, they hold this view that doesn't align with me. How did, how did you wrestle with that in your mind in your 20s, now, now in your 30s? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, Ezra. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, to a certain extent, um, it's something that all Christians will have to do at some point um, as they grow in maturity, uh, in Christian maturity. Um, they're going to recognize that there are um, smart, gifted, godly um, teachers who disagree on matters of theological importance um, sharply with one another and uh, disagree about everything from the opening chapters of Genesis to how to understand the doctrine of the Trinity and the attributes of God and the incarnation and so forth. Um, and that can be um, that can create some vertigo um, because you recognize, wow, these these folks are way smarter than I am. Like, it's exhausting. Can, it can be very exhausting. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exhausting and, and also scary because yeah. you kind yeah. of assume, like, well, well I'm never going to get to be where they're at. And if they can't right. figure it out, then what am I going to do? Um, so at that point, um, I think that the appropriate response um, is to return to the word of God um, and recognize that just because Christians disagree about matters of importance doesn't mean, um, one, that there's no truth of the matter, uh, and two, that God hasn't revealed what that truth is. Um, hmm. Hmm. in the scriptures. Um, and so uh, returning to the word of God and, and reading scripture for yourself um, and listening 
as best you can to the competing arguments um, and evaluating them and with an eye towards, okay, um, judging it in light of what scripture teaches about the particular issue. Um, that's, that's the way forward. I don't think that it needs to lead to radical skepticism to the, to the conclusion that, oh, well, Christians yeah. disagree. Therefore we can't know anything. Yep. Um, so, yeah. D Dave, that, what are your thoughts here? Your see, listeners? I think what Joel just said there is touched on the, the crux of the matter for me. And I think it's an issue maybe on, if you took any number of issues, but you mentioned Genesis, like either folks that kind of read the Bible, maybe very flat, very, everything's in a neat little box because I did a, uh, I did a word study, you know? And so now I get it. I get, I get God because I understand this. I know that word and I know this and I know the context. And so, because I know that on the other side, you know, Oh, isn't it so cute that, that people used to think that Jesus fed all these people with a, a, a young man's lunch, <laughs> you know? And so everything is also explained away. And I, I guess my, my pastoral concern is that for somebody who, who loves the sciences, I, I started as an engineer many moons ago. And just to know that I wish somebody would have come along and said, you know, Christianity has satisfied some of the greatest minds the world has ever known. And isn't it great? Um, that a lot of these, you know, like Christians are not anti-science. Oh, have you ever, have you ever heard of John Lennox? You need to read some Lennox, like just introducing, because I think this narrative, and I think, I mean, I think there's spiritual warfare involved, but this, this narrative that somehow Christians are anti-science or that theology and science, or even just understanding the limitations of science. I think what happens, so I'm monologuing a bit, but what happens that I'm frustrated about for people that love science in churches is they end up getting pushed to people and read to read them because they, they embrace science more, but they might not even be Christian and they embrace sort of a hermeneutic of suspicion to borrow Jasper's words. And you end up creating a bunch of skeptics. I, I, I think when we disagree, I, I think we need to push back and say, Hey, let's go back to the creeds. Can we all, can we embrace some of this? Okay, let, let's let's talk about what we embrace. Let's talk about all the supernatural stuff we embrace. When we had uh, John Walton on six, eight months ago, as I don't know when we talked about yeah. Genesis stuff at length with him, but he like affirmed the miracles, affirmed, affirmed. And so like so much of the time, I feel like we're when I hear his name, we're we're talking about minutia. But he's like, no, 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 I believe in this. So I think I think just getting people to embrace even somebody who's scientifically minded, there's limits to science. Uh, I was sitting in uh, the Omnimax theater with um, family one time watching this monarch butterfly movie or something. And they all fly to this very small spot in Mexico to mate and reproduce. And the, this sort of scientist uh, that's or somebody that's narrating sounds very educated, says, we have no idea why they how do they know how to get here? We have no idea why they fly to this couple of square miles they just know how to get here how do we and i'm just like well i know that that's that's i'm just a simpleton but i know i it's god okay and so just to sort of embrace science but also embrace mystery and embrace that there are some things that i'm not going to get because if i get it then i'm going to be god and so just understanding that limitation does that does that resonate mm -hmm. with you at all yeah, absolutely. Uh, and what do you do with mystery, Joel? I'm curious because Dave and I were talking about that offline. I'd be curious to get your talk, you know, thoughts yeah. on that. Like, what do you do with that? Yeah. yeah. So, um, great question. Um, yeah. I, I first off, I, I completely agree that um, the uh, there needs to be the how to put this. Okay, so the appropriate response to our encounter with um, both what Scripture reveals is true and what we learn about the world as true with science is um, epistemic humility, meaning um, yes, I'm I'm humble about what I'm what I know and what I'm learning and I recognize that um, this is 
a partial view. Um, and I am open to further light on this issue. Um, and I want to receive further light on this issue. Um, and so, uh, and, and really, so I, I think that, um, that also gets to, to Ezra's question about mysteries. Well, like anytime we're dealing with God, um, we're thinking about him, we're talking about him. If there's ever a time to be humble about what we know, it's now, you know, omnipotent, omniscient creator of everything that is, oh yeah, I have that figured out. Um, and so there's, there's an appropriate response that is, is faithful to what God has revealed about himself in his word. Um, but at the same time, um, also recognizes our own creaturely limitations as finite, fallible, fallen um, creatures. We're fallen knowers. And hmm. in virtue of that, we need to recognize, like, no, there's there, there are things that we don't know. So when I'm talking with someone in good faith, uh, whether it's a, a believer in my congregation that has, has questions about what our church believes about the creation of the universe. Um, I really, really urge and encourage pastors to, to make sure their congregations know that they're safe people to talk with us about. Um, and that the conversations can actually be good and productive and they don't have to be defensive. Um, but yeah, so does that... Uh, I do want to also yeah. one one second thought related to what David was saying about kind of the limitations of science. One of the um, one of the big takeaways for me from the project that we we were doing um, with the Henry Center, um, which just real quick blurb about that because it's what kind of the book came out of. We were doing a six year project on science and the doctrine of creation um, that was an attempt to catalyze the field. Uh, of theology of creation within evangelicalism and um, to do so in a way that's attuned with the natural sciences. And so we brought scientists and theologians and biblical scholars and historians together for conferences, events, uh, etc., to hash some of this stuff out, uh, to hash out the, the bigger questions. And the book came out of one of those conferences. Um, but one of the big things that I took away from the conference uh, or from the project was you know, the value and importance of interdisciplinary work and conversations and the difficulty of it. Because uh, what we would end up finding is um, we'd find a theologian would be presenting and he'd, he'd make some largish claim and the science scientist would hope, whoa, 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 back up, hold on. Actually, current studies in neuroscience or, you know, recent theories in philosophy of mind, et cetera, would suggest kind of the opposite of what you're saying. And so there'd have to be some backpedaling. Or conversely, a scientist would make some claim. A theologian or a philosopher would say, well, actually, hold on, that's the claim you're making is a metaphysical claim. It's not a scientific claim. Um, and you need to realize that you're, it's okay to make that sort of claim, but you're outstripping the science in doing so. Um, and so it was this really, really healthy, um, really difficult work um, that is also important because we we end up we're we're in, we're in our little disciplinary silos, whether it's science, theology, biblical studies, whatever, um, and we're not talking to other disciplines. It's easy to start not recognizing the limitations of your own discipline. That's a good word. Start, from start to finish. Those six years, how many people do you think you interact with, like professionals on, on the study? I mean, was it dozens, uh, um, hundreds? Uh, well, so we had somewhere between six and eight resident fellows a year that were in our offices, and then uh, six congregations a year, every year for six years, and then the the conferences. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the, the network that ended up getting built up was a couple hundred, I think. Was there ever a point when you were going through that? What, what were the aha moments for you? 
mm. in, in your life? Were there key areas where maybe you even changed your mind? Um, so, so one of them was so of, of the different programs, the Stott Award was my favorite. It was the, um, the congregational partnership um, where we, we partnered with six congregations every year. They got $15,000 to focus on the doctrine of creation for a year with their local church. And so they did book studies, they did brought in speakers, they did pulpit supply. Some of them even threw together little conferences. Um, and it was actually the first year when um, there was, he was a literal rocket scientist um, who was at our, um, our, one of our January consultation with, the, with all the congregations. And he just said, you know, hey, I really valued this. Um, because I feel like I can finally talk about my work at my church. Hmm. And he said, Not because, powerful. yeah. And he said, most, uh, most of us scientists feel more comfortable talking with our, our other scientists about our faith. Yep. Than we do talking about our science with our other, with other believers. Mm. Wow. Which to me, that was just like conviction, like, wow. Yeah. Like, how have we blown it that bad that we have these, these brilliant gifted members of the body of Christ who, who are not, it's not just that they're not being utilized, they're being cut off. Yeah. Like they're, um, so that, that really, that was one of the biggest light bulb moments for me that like, Hey, we need to, as a church, we need to do better. Um, well, I think that goes across the board. I don't, Dave, I'd be curious to get your thoughts, yeah. but like, Joel, when you think about not not just in terms of scientists, but you think of you know philosophy, and you know, and then the trades. You think of how many yeah. people come to church each week and have a specific trade, but there's no connection of that with what's going on, and that they leave, and that's kind of the I guess the big thing about why we emphasize the Monday Christian, right? Turning Sunday belief into Monday action. Right. That connection between the two, because if you have a divorce between those two things of how well my belief is one day and how I live it out. It's just you settle for something where a compartmentalized life and it's it's exhausting and, and it's it's kind of isolating. I mean, because I've, I've talked to people that have lived this life and, and man, my heart goes out to them because it can be years where they feel like no one understands them, where there's this part of their life that the deepest thing that should be about them, right? The, the community, the body of Christ doesn't understand. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about your project and this book, frankly, is, is that it bridges those two together. I mean, Dave, what are you thinking? Yeah, I think we, we need, we need in the body, we need to, to learn from one another. And I think it, it would take away the stigma and some of the, the narrative that has been pushed forward, like faith and science and how, how all there's all this opposition. And of course, you know, um, for all the good that a lot of, D debates do um from you know lennox and doc and all these people it, that could also maybe further that view but just to have someone who we, we can chat and we can learn we can learn why science makes their faith deeper like you know i've seen this in a lab and i'm like how in the world does this happen or wow look at how intentional this looks you know like mm -hmm. I, I just I think some of those conversations, you know i'd love for my kids to be around somebody like that that has this deeply inquisitive mind and can point out these things and say, man, isn't God awesome? Um, well, and actually have a space where you can do that without judgment, right? Because that, that's the hard thing because someone brings up something, well, okay, well, they get categorized as X, right? And all of a sudden, and so, I mean, Joel, r real quickly, I mean, in this book, if I were to, you know, you know, boil it down, I would say, you know, you take 10 popular um, theologians from the past, what, 150 years, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Um, and people from B.B. Warfield, you know, Carl Barth, you know, and so forth. And you show how there's like, you know, we have different contributors to this, but you're as you're editing this and you're overseeing it, you have all these differences of opinion and people that are are sharing on the science. So when you're going through this and you're doing the heavy work of editing, as I know it is, um, what's that like for you? Well, uh, go, I'll go back to that again. What were some aha moments you had through this whole book project? Yeah. Yeah. No, great question. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, 
editing is hard work. It's even harder when when you immensely respect the, the authors <laughs> that, yeah. that are contributing. You're kind of like wrong here. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 either this is a typo, but <laughs> on the other hand, yeah. So um, I'm pretty sure two isn't with three O's, but I could be mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, yeah, the, some of the the aha moments were were recognizing. Um, you know, the way that different Protestant theologians, um, well, well, so there are a couple big key takeaways. One was um, some Protestant theologians just totally blew it. Um, <laughs> they, they either did not interact with the sciences at all or um, the science that they were interacting with wasn't great or outdated or something. Um, but on the other hand, there were, there were also, um, really interesting and creative ways that major Protestant theologians of the 20th, uh, century engaged with the sciences and often did so is from, um, from kind of surprisingly open, uh, kind of vantage points. So one of the, the folks you mentioned, B.B. Warfield, um, he's, you know, one of the, the old Princetonians. So kind of uh, classical conservative Calvinist. Um, and Brad Gunlock uh, in his chapter, he shows that there are some, some things, some positions that he absolutely was not going to budge on because he saw them as central and he's central to the Christian faith. Uh, but, then when he interacted with kind of the scientific theories of the day, um, he didn't do so from an overly defensive posture. Hmm. Um, so that was one aspect, uh, was kind of the different ways. But then also the fact that um, when we talk about science and faith, we often think of kind of, oh, okay, that means the doctrine of creation in terms of origins, where the universe came from, where the world came from. Um, actually, that's only a very small part of the science and faith discussions. Um, there's a lot, it's a lot bigger because, um, we still called it science and the doctrine of creation because classically the doctrine of creation covered not just origins, but also everything that is not God. Um, because if you think about it, unless it's God, it's created. Hmm. Um, and so the doctrine of creation covers uh, the whole sweep of everything else that isn't him. Um, because that stuff was created. And if that stuff is created, your doctrine of creation implicates things about it. And so things like, what is human nature? You know, what are we as, as a human species? Um, what's our ontological makeup, the, those sorts of questions, which, which actually different sciences other than just, you know, kind of, you know, evolutionary theory or, or what have you, um, different sciences can speak into. Um, yeah. So yeah, th those were kind of two of the big takeaways. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it's, it's so fascinating. I mean, um, Again, well, I'll just read a couple of comments because I know we need to wrap you up here pretty soon. But um, I threw out a, a question here on my Facebook page. What are the top reasons people say science, science and faith are incompatible? Uh, Josh writes in, because with science theory, they can still do the stuff they want with the Bible. It sheds a new light on it. Uh, Aaron writes in, uh, one of the main reasons they view this is uh, young earth creationism, um, on repeatable nature of miracles, miracles that have been faked ancient near eastern uh, mythology poetic nature of the old testament describing things in ways we now know aren't true a water above and below four corners of the earth etc uh, melissa writes in just misunderstandings don't understand each other and then james writes in because they think science is secular instead of a search for truth and truth leads to faith so, so several different responses there but just to wrap up, I guess one of the reasons, Joel, I really wanted to have you on is that, you know, it's called Abundant Christian Podcast. And sometimes we think, oh, okay, well, let's just talk about 
surface level things. I mean, how do you live a better life? How do you, you know, and, and so forth, right? The things that really matter to a Christian. But I guess one of the things that I really want to tap into is just exactly what you said earlier, is the person that's sitting in the pew week after week, the chairs or whatever they're sitting in, and and they're, they're sitting there and they're saying, man, there's a part of my life that just does not connect to my faith. And so the person that's like that right now, and they've felt the pain of that, um, where, where should they go? What are, are some steps they could take to really um, strengthen their faith and understanding in this area as, as your faith has been strengthened? Yeah, no, uh, that's a great question. Um, well, so thankfully there's resources uh, out there. Um, so the one of the things that we did uh, with the Creation Project is uh, we had an online periodical, still have an online periodical, Sapiencia, where uh, we, oh, man, couple, three, four hundred articles on there. Um, I'm spitballing here. It's, I think it's close to that. Uh, on different issues on science and faith. So uh, if you just go to henrycenter.org, um, that will take you to the Henry Center's website. And then there's a tab called Sapiencia. Um, yeah, and that's in the show notes you. below, so you can just click that. You don't have to write it as you're driving. Please don't. Brilliant. Ask. Brilliant. Yeah, please do not do that. <laughs> um, science says it would be a bad idea. Um <laughs> So, uh, but then also, um, the, the American, so the ASA, the American scientific association, um, is wonderful organization that, uh, I've been a little bit involved in, um, and that we connected with, with the Henry center of kind of folks working in the sciences. They have an annual conference, they have a, a journal. Um, there's some folks that, uh, you could check out and hook up with, uh, but then more than anything, um, I would encourage you to, to talk to folks at your church. Uh, if, if your church is a healthy, nurturing space, uh, don't be afraid to, to raise these questions, uh, to, to, to speak with, you know, the small group leader or the pastor about, Hey, you know, I, I've been wrestling with this question. Um, because really I, I think, um, these these sorts of issues uh, are best worked out at the local church level, where we can talk face to face with one another and say, Good. you know, like, hey, I don't understand this, um, or you know, I I think this. Can you help me reconcile this with that? Um, that's yep. the ideal. Love it. Dave, I know you got to go because Dave has a date after this. And last hey. week on our podcast with Bill Urey, uh, we learned that holiness, one of the primary things of holiness is loving your spouse well. And so Dave has to go put his faith into action here. Hey. <laughs> but Joel, man, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks, brother. And Good work. This. Super helpful. And we'll link all this in the show notes below. So thank you again for coming on. Yeah, it was a delight to be with both of you. Thank